welcome back to Loki's Library, and if you are new here, welcome. I am your librarian, Katrina. This is where I am reading through the enormous library books that you see behind me, and then I give you a quick synopsis and tell you what I think about them. So if you like books, just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, and let me know what you think in the comments. Rounding out our month on social justice, this week's book of the week is Woke. Oh, I'm holding it in a different hand. It should be over here. Woke Inc. Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam by Vivek Ramaswamy. The accompanying cocktail is The Wake Up Call, which is two ounces of rum, a half ounce of simple syrup, one and a half ounces of espresso, two dashes of orange bitters, and two dashes of smoked chili bitters. So let's do this. I actually don't have espresso, but I do have some coffee left over, so I'm just using the ounce and a half of coffee that I had left over from this morning. The book opens with an introduction to the woke industrial complex, explaining how this came to be and Ramaswamy's role in it. Because he's writing this book from an insider's perspective, um, he, he did not grow up rich. I mean, he grew up the son of two immigrants in Ohio, eventually earning his way into Harvard and then Yale Law School. So very smart. I mean, you, I mean money is, yes, important to get into those places, but even more important is intelligence. And he's very smart to have made it into both of those schools. But having attended Harvard and Yale, Ramaswamy earned his own way into the halls of finance and power, eventually forming his own pharmaceutical company called Royvant Sciences. Two ounces of rum. He then goes on to explain how corporate finance is like a magic trick. All right, first you have to find an ordinary market where ordinary people sell ordinary things. Um, in his case, it was drugs. I mean, legally, of course, at least in this, his case, but drugs. I mean, illegal drugs are also big finance, but that's not the topic of this book. That's something else entirely. So legal drugs. Um, next, you have to find an arbitrage in the market and squeeze the hell out of it. Our arbitrage, for what that means, is uh, simultaneously purchase and sell the same thing or a similar asset in different markets in order to profit from tiny differences in the asset's listed price. So that's the, you know, you buy it low, sell it high, right? That's basic arbitrage. And it exploits the short-lived variations in the price of identical or similar financial instruments in different markets or in different forms. That's what arbitrage does. Now, most business, business books stop there, right? Find your niche, buy low, sell high. That, th th those are the two basic fundamentals of, of markets, right? Ramaswamy then reveals that there's a third dirty little secret behind high finance, which is pretend that you care about something other than profit and power precisely to gain more of each. And that's what Woke Inc. is. They're pretending to care about something other than profit and power, and the results have been magnificent for corporate America. I know, dogs. It's very hot in here. If I could trust you not to eat my shoes, I would totally let you run around downstairs. And that's what's going on with big business in the 21st century, specifically in the last decade, with a monstrous explosion of the hat trick corporate America has pulled off um, not only retaining their corporate power, but convincing the useful idiots that corporate America is actually on their side. Um, to clarify, a hat trick is three successes of the same kind consecutively, usually within a limited period of time. Uh, in corporate America, that hat trick is convincing the world that they actually care about diversity, inclusion, and equity more than family. Um, Ramaswamy lifts the curtain and shows just how deep that deception runs because here's a big hint to you. Corporate America cares about none of those things. Two dashes. Two dashes of orange bitters. Hmm. Yes, they are bitter for a reason. So here's some examples. Uh, and he provides multiple examples, not just single, singular examples, because singular examples, of course, can be written off as, well, that's just that company doing something wrong. But he, he shows how this is pretty prevalent across all corporations. How about the fearless girl statue down on Wall Street? That's the very first example he gives, because those are tiny, shitty little bitter dashes. I know. But you literally just ate my sandals, so I really can't let you out, because now i got to go buy new sandals. All right. I gotta shake this up real quick. So the Fearless Girl statue on Wall Street, and this one right here, right? It's facing down the bowl, uh, the bowl of Wall Street. It's, it's an empty symbol, it's an empty gesture, denoting how much women affect the markets because see, she is the one who does it. Well, it's not actually. Rather than actually paying the women on Wall Street an equal salary, they paid millions of dollars for this statue as kind of an empty gesture. 
Uh, they later sued the creator of the statue, Kristen Visbal, saying that by making three unauthorized reproductions of the statue, Visbal damaged State Street's global campaign in support of female leadership and gender diversity. That's a quote from the book, and I'm sure that's a quote from the actual lawsuit. Because nothing says we support women like suing the creator of the statue that has come to embody Wall Street, who happens to be a woman. And the left still supports Wall Street, based entirely on this empty statue. It was a feel-good gesture that won them and has paid multiple dividends in Wall on Wall Street. So while the right tends to believe the absolute infallibility of the markets, right, which is fair, if, if the corporations would play by the rules of the game and Congress would just then the, the free markets will correct themselves. And, and that is true, the free markets will. We don't have free markets. We haven't had free markets in 100 years in this com country. We've had corporatism. We've had crony capitalism. We have not had free markets. And again, anybody who has an ounce of intellectual honesty will acknowledge that that's true. Not for long, though. I mean, the, right, the right's coming around to the, to the um, the knowledge that the markets are not infallible and, and are becoming more and more aware of corporatism. Um, they're doing this, ironically enough, as a result of the woke campaigns that cater to ideals that the right typically doesn't support. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a wake-up call, all right. God, you can't even taste the rum. You can taste the coffee. Definitely a little smoke flavor. Oh, I like that one. Oh, Oh, I might have a new favorite one for now. Oh my God. So Ramaswamy then explains what capitalism should be based on the early court decisions that allowed for the unbridled capitalism that grew America into the richest nation on earth. We were the richest nation on earth. Um, China is definitely encroaching on that market. Oh, and how woke capitalism is destroying that prosperity to pander to the vocal minority to the detriment of everyone. Like literally, the, the nation is going down the toilet and we're spinning faster and faster in that vortex. Uh, essentially, the point of a corporation is to make money. Like full stop, that's it. Their, point, the, the, their job is to generate profits for the shareholders, the people who actually put money into the company. Um, this is allowed by multiple court decisions over the last 200 years that laid the groundwork for corporations to make money while limiting the liabilities of the owners of that company. So in return, Corporations are supposed to, in a perfect world, when they're not dirty and corrupt, literally stay in their lane. That's their job. Make money. Stay in that lane. Make money. In practice, corporations have, basically from the beginning, been buying off Congress critters and local politicians to ensure policies were passed for the good of their own companies. Now, that's not in the book, I, and I don't necessarily blame Ramaswamy for not knowing that. I only know this and say, I only say this with a fair degree of confidence because of the books I've been reading on the presidents that basically all, every single one of them has included some aspect of politicians taking money from corporations to make taxes on the corporations bearable while taxing the out of their enemies. It, it's just, this is how it has always been. Now that's taxes. And that, that's not, that's part of it, but it is a separate thing because we are talking specifically about corporations focusing on making money. And to that end, lowering their own taxes while raise, raising taxes on their competitors is right in line with that, right? That's making money for your corporation. But they've always done so through Congress. That's not the topic of this book. With the rise of woke culture, the, a new, more horrifying policy has taken over corporate finance and that is called stakeholder capitalism. What's the difference? Shareholder capitalism, which has been the working model up until recently, is where the corporations make money for the people who have bought into the company. So if you own stocks in Apple, Disney, Microsoft, those corporations are supposed to be focused on one thing, making money for the people who own stock in the company. Stakeholder capitalism is where the company tries to make everyone who does business with that company happy. Consequently, the uber-woke, blue-haired liberals who spend their days on TikTok finding life in general problematic are now steering the ship as their loud vocal whining leads corporations to believe this is what America wants. But also, it's a way for corporations to gain control of Congress without actually having to run for Congress themselves. By caving to this vocal minority, corporations are being actively encouraged to participate openly in politics. 
So while before everything was done, like decorum in the 18th and 19th century demanded that buying off politicians be done behind closed doors so that we actually, we never actually saw what we might suspect was going on. We didn't actually know what was going on. We could suspect it, and people did. They railed all the time about that dirty bastard and, you know, this Senate or the White House or whatever. But we didn't know what was going on, except for a few very key things. You know, teapot dome scandal pops to mind immediately. But with the rise of stakeholder capitalism, corporations are being encouraged by members of the public to become involved in politics. They're being told, no, you don't have to stay in your lane, except for Elon Musk. They very much wanted Elon Musk to stay in the Tesla lane. He branched out and bought Twitter, and that created its own show. Not in this book at all, because that happened after the book was published. I'm sure it's in one of Ramaswamy's future books, or other books. He has two more that he's written since then. That violates every tenet of capitalism. Corporations' one job is to make money for their shareholders. Stakeholders have no stake in the company. They literally don't. I don't know why they're called stakeholders. They have no stake in the company. They didn't put any money into it. The only money they put into it is what they buy in a legal capitalist transaction. Theoretically, they should have no say in how a company is run. Enter the golden rule. Not, not the one where you treat others how they would want to be treated. The one that says he who has the gold makes the rules. If I own five shares in Apple, I mean, I don't. This is just an, for example then my opinion that Apple should quit pandering to woke ideology should matter more than the blue-haired TikTok star who owns no shares of Apple but films her videos on her iPhone. However, my opinion means very little to Apple compared to the Congress critter who owns one million shares of Apple and wants to essentially buy the goodwill of the blue-haired TikTok star. I feel like... I feel like there should definitely be a law where if you are sitting in Congress, you are prohibited from trading in the stock market. Like, it's literally illegal for you or any of your immediate family members to trade in the stock market. At all. I feel like that would go a long way towards helping corruption. So I'm going to throw that out there. Let's see if Ramaswamy sees this and gets the hint, because that's a good one. CEOs of major corporations have figured out that they don't actually have to be elected to run a country. Uh, he cited the example of J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon kneeling in his office, in his very posh multi-million dollar office, in solidarity with BLM activists. And he was lauded for doing so. 125 years ago, J.P. Morgan, for whom the bank is named because it was actually his bank when he started, was despised and hated for saying, I owe the public nothing, which is true. He owed the public absolutely nothing. In fact, the point of fact is the public owed him everything, literally everything. I'll get back to that in just a second. Damone acts like he owes the public everything, but in fact owes it nothing. It's a show. It's smoke and mirrors to buy feel-good moments from an angry public in an attempt to pay the Dane Geld. Remember the Dane Geld? I went over it last week in, in the book, in Andy Noe's book, Antifa. Uh, I'm not going to go over it again now, but yeah. And there's no way this ends well. And it is really ironic. So here's why I said literally the public owes J.P. Morgan everything. The actual J.P. Morgan literally prevented the economic collapse of the country in the late 19th century. Learned that two months ago with the Grover Cleveland book, right? And this one, this one right here. Remember I said that Cleveland made a deal with the devil when the country ran out of money? It was J.P. Morgan who provided that gold at interest to bail the nation out. I mean, no wonder the nation is so quick to bail out banks. The banks have bailed out the nation before. It's very much a back-scratching enterprise between the two. It's dirty politics, no matter what you call it. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase, incidentally, is the largest bank in the United States. For those who don't know, it bought failing banks during the 2008 financial crisis at enormous discounts. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase does not actually need the goodwill of the vocal minority. It, it, it's already that large bank, so if they don't need that goodwill, they don't actually have to pander to this sh Why are they doing so? I mean, what game is J.P. Morgan playing? How about China? China are good friends across the sea. China is the country that is actively running concentration camps against the Muslim Uyghurs, forcing sterilization on them, essentially slave labor camps. Uh, China is taking over Hong Kong and Taiwan and insists that both be recognized as being provinces of China. And 
any company that wants to do business in China will do what they say. I'm, the more I learn, the more I read books like this, I am actually a little bit grateful for the whole COVID pandemic that forced me to shut down the business I was running here before because I was buying my silk from China. Eventually, I would have to pander to the too if I wanted to keep buying silk from China. I am not in that position anymore. Companies from Disney to NBA, Google, they're all complying. They're all chasing that sweet China dollars. And about the only company that hasn't publicly caved to China is South Park, who mercilessly mocked China in season 23 and 24 of, South, uh, of their South Park, right? Um, season 23, if you watch, I think it's episode two, Banned in China. Season 24, the pandemic special. Brutal. Brutally funny. I, I, my God. South Park remains at the forefront of holding up this brutally honest mirror to the woke crowd. I, I actually dread the day that Trey Parker and Matt Stone decide to hang it up because we will lose a crucial voice in, in pushing back this tide of insanity. I mean, South Park has basically been grandfathered into the things they say and do. Uh, so far, at least, they remain unscathed by this insanity. Um, none of that's in this book. Well, he, he mentioned South Park once in this book to, to prove one of his points. Which episode was it? Aspen. Yeah, that, that one. He, he mentions that one in the book, which is funny because it proves his point, and I get it. But South Park is... Eh. Woke Inc. is encouraging people to shout down, threaten, and physically harm anyone who disagrees with the message. In one generation, we went from Voltaire, I may not agree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it, which is one of the founding principles of this country, to agree with me or you're a fascist pig who deserves to be publicly crucified. Like literally crucified, not verbally, but like literally hands on the cross crucified. Which is really interesting because eventually with this encouragement to violate shareholder trust, someone with enough gold who actually is a fascist is bound to take over at least one company and put a stop to this shit. I mean, hell, look how quickly the left lost their mind when Musk, who as far as I know is not a fascist, purchased Twitter and restored even a modicum of free speech. I mean, they lost their f***ing minds. The book is filled with examples of this, like, ever-faltering tower of self-righteousness, which contributes to the division in the country. And as Ramaswamy says, a good barometer for the health of any democracy is the percentage of people who are willing to say what they actually believe in public. I mean, that number is falling by the day. And the left is cheering like this is some good thing, like they are the winners of some great culture war here. And Ramaswamy points out in the book that no, you are the new McCarthy. You are doing exactly what McCarthy did and history does not remember him kindly. So on one hand, we have the average person scared to speak up against this bullshit while the corporations continue to pander. Another example is Uber swearing to be an anti-racist company while lobbying for Proposition 22 in California, which permits Uber to classify all drivers as independent contractors. Uh, this, incidentally, means that Uber doesn't have to pay any benefits to their drivers. And that would, their reason for arguing against having to classify them as employees versus contractors is it would impact their profitability. And they lobbied hard for Proposition 22. But they kept the goodwill of the public because, hey, we stand with Black Lives Matter. So they claim to be anti-racist, which keeps the goodwill of the people, while ultimately protecting their bottom line for their shareholders. They pay lip service to being the good guys while doing nothing to actually benefit their employees, essentially playing both ends against the middle to ensure that they remain the winners. Another example is Unilever. This one actually outraged me. I don't really buy their products just because I don't. I don't know, but this one outraged me. Uh, Unilever has tea plantations in Kenya. Following the December 2007 elections in Kenya, rioting led to hundreds of men attacking the workers at the plantation, resulting in multiple rapes and assaults. Unilever had paid for armed guards to protect their tea plantations and to protect the managers' homes, but left the workers to be assaulted and raped. And then, rather than addressing this error directly, they closed the plantation for six months following the attacks, leaving the already raped and brutalized women unemployed. Unpaid leave. So, here, take a few mental health days to deal with the trauma of having been raped. We're not going to pay you for it, but you've got the time to recover now. And um, 
they never directly addressed this. They they hid behind man-made law when it was brought to suit in England, which they won because of course they did. Unilever is an English company and they were sued in the court of England rather than in Kenya. And Unilever, to keep their name in good public standing, writes a million dollar check annually to the UN women who then say, oh yes, Unilever is women friendly. So do with that information what you will. Ramaswamy points out that the role that social, con socially conscious economic policy creates bubbles, which burst with horrifying consequences. I mean, witness the 2008 housing bubble burst. I mean, that entire scandal happened as a direct result of politicians wanting to buy voter goodwill by insisting on banks allowing subprime mortgages. So if you, prior to this housing bubble, which was created, it started in the 70s, believe it or not. Ultimately, it was ramped up under Bill Clinton's administration when they started insisting that the banks had to loan to anybody with X credit score. And X was a very low number, like 550 versus the prime mortgages and how the bank swung this deal with the politicians to make it financially feasible to do so is if you had a lower credit score, you didn't get the good interest rates and you could only do, usually do it through an adjustable rate mortgage. So adjustable rate mortgages start out at a low teaser rate where your, your mortgage might be $700 a month. But then after the teaser period ends, it adjusts the mortgage up to the current, whatever the current interest rates are. And so your mortgage payment might go from $700 a month to $2,200 a month. And there was no refinancing because your credit was shit. So that entire scandal happened as a result of politicians wanting to buy voter goodwill by insisting on banks allowing these subprime mortgages. There is a book about this, which I have not read yet, although I do own it, called The Big Short by Michael Lewis. This was made into a movie by the same name, which was very good and explains in digestible bits exactly what happened between 2005 and 2008 that led to an enormous loss of wealth and employment for the nation as a whole. Now, one might think that with that information, a smart person could look at the market, figure out the timeline and make a killing on, on shorting current star stocks. However, as Ramaswamy points out, while the big short was a result of bad government policy, the big business was not at that time actually directing the government policy, merely reacting to the policies that were enacted by government. Now, thanks to the encouragement of woke activists, big business is directly directing government policy. It will be much harder to predict that bubble burst and harder for the country to survive it when it does go. And it will go. Woke and capitalism are not happy bedfellows. So what do we do? Um, thankfully, this book was not just this, this panic clarion call. And it was, but Ramaswamy also provides some suggestions for how to fight back. Uh, first off, he is not a fan of boycotts, um, believes that they contribute to the political divide in the country, which I get. I mean, I, you could counter, right, by saying that boycotting woke corporate measures or how other stakeholders, right, use their own language against them. The other stakeholders are expressing their voice that they are not happy with the policies being enacted that affect the products they use. And, and it's successful to some degree. I mean, witness how quickly <laughs> Bud Light caved in the face of the Dylan Mulvaney scandal. Um, so basically they're just fighting fire with fire, right? The currently disenfranchised are using the tactics that have worked so well for the formerly disenfranchised. I mean, looked at that way, it makes sense. However, it also proves Ramaswamy's point. Where does it end? Where does this tit for tat end? How do we stop this ever going divide that is tearing our nation apart? And that's a good point. So we need to open up the internet and social media to competing ideas. That's one thing. And he's not just talking about unbanning parlor, although that's certainly a good step. He's talking about the blatant censorship that occurs across social media platforms that have become de facto branches of the government. See, Section 230, which was passed in the early 1990s, has granted internet corporations a get-out-of-jail-free card by determining that they are, in fact, platforms, not publishers. What this, and, and this has been consistently upheld by the courts. Most recently, Google won a, 230, a Section 230 suit. I don't remember the details of it, but I'll find the article and I'll post a link or headline or something so you can Google it yourself. So what this means, basically, is that when Alex Jones says something truly heinous on his YouTube channel, 
YouTube and or Google cannot be sued for it. They have to sue Alex Jones directly, which they did. Since YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter are platforms, not publishers, they have no reason to censor anybody. Yet they do so, often at the behest of Congress. How does that work? Um, Congress says, we'll pass laws that are favorable to you, but you need to keep XYZ off of your platforms. It's that simple. And we know this is true thanks to Elon Musk's release of the Twitter files. There is, and no doubt will be, more First Amendment suits pending, and rightly so. The woke left has celebrated their victory over right-wingers for years and delighted in social media complicity, going on and on about, it's private property, they can do what they want with it. But the more the curtain is pulled back, the more we know that, that just ain't so. It's a publicly traded company, and according to the rules of stakeholder capitalism, the stake with the loudest voice is going to win. So we got to be a lot more vocal, folks. It can't just be a couple of people. It can't just be me reviewing books on my tiny YouTube channel and James Lindsay shouting into the wind about how you got to speak up. You have to speak up. So there's one way to fight back, right? I mean, restore the open market up place of ideas to public discourse. Uh, incidentally, this also involves people who disagree with woke ideology voicing their opinion. You have to. You have to speak up before you lose the ability to do so. Another way we can help is pushing hard on the fact that wokeness is a religion. And he leans hard on this one. He, he spends two chapters going over wokeness as a religion. Why is this important? Why would we want this ideology to be granted the status of a religious exemption, right? Um, religious exemptions are granted to Christians, Muslims, Judaism, Buddhism, paganism. Because if the church of woke is recognized as a religion, then corporations become legally prohibited from forcing their religious beliefs on the people who work for them. He's got some very compelling arguments to that effect in his book. Um, he went to Harvard, I think, for business. He went to Yale for law school. His arguments are very compelling. If they try to mandate, basically, if it's if woke, if the Church of Woke is recognized, then the corporations that subscribe to the Church of Woke if they try to mandate dye training, you have legal recourse to say that they are forcing their religion on you, which is illegal. Same for colleges. So when you engage in political discourse, politely point out that you follow a different religion. Ramaswamy provides five key points to replace diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, excellence first, institutional purpose, institutional pluralism, separation of corporation and states, not just church and states, corporation and states, and end discrimination. So excellency first, diversity is not an end in and of itself. Diversity of thought, i.e. true diversity, is a means to achieving excellence. Institutional purpose, a company should find its own unique purpose divorced from diet ideology. What kind of diversity are they seeking that will help them achieve that purpose? If the only diversity they want is skin deep, then what they actually want is homogeneity. Institutional pluralism, uh, pluralism, not everybody knows what that word means. It's a condition or system in which two or more states, groups, principles, sources of authority, etc. coexist. Basically, learn to live and converse with people who think differently from you. Great things can be achieved by mixing up thoughts with diverse opinions. And we're, we're drowning under the homogeneity of die culture. Separation of corporation and state. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I can add anything to this. Corporations should stay in their lane. That's what he's saying. And end discrimination. And the best way to stop discrimination is to just stop discriminating. And we were basically there in the early 1990s. Then woke happened, and it's been all downhill ever since. Finally, Ramaswamy rec recommends mandatory civil service for when kids are in high school. And I don't, in principle, have a problem with this, but in reality, I see rich kids buying their way out of it or paying to get into plum positions that they want that will advance their agenda. I would take a civil service idea a step further and mandate that anyone in X tax bracket will be assigned to cleaning up roadsides. There's your civil service. Keep our highways beautiful. And if you're below that X point, you get into a lottery to determine where you go. And you might get drawn to work in city hall. You might get help at the police departments, community center, fire departments, you know, so something that will actually possibly 
give you some advancement in this world besides just cleaning up roadside trash. And I can even use Ramaswamy's own example in the book to demonstrate why I know I'm right about this and that rich kids would buy their way out. Um, he tells a story about how he was trying to build goodwill with a possible investor and was having dinner at the investor's house, but I think that was right. Um, the guy's kid came down, was very polite and well-spoken, uh, you know, held a good conversation and asked Ramaswamy for advice on getting into Harvard. Ramaswamy advised the kids that the kid that the real ticket to standing out during your college application was to provide something that he had done that no one else had done. And the kid had already done that. He had founded a not-for-profit dedicated to helping out victims of sex trafficking. It was perfect, right? God knows that's a cause that needs help. Uh, but Ramaswamy then has to wonder if the kid kept up the not-for-profit once he got into Harvard and entered corporate finance, or was that just a box he could check off on his college application? Well, if it's just a box to check off on your college application, then it might as well just be mindless work that's done for community service, like picking up roadside trash. Also, it helps to uh, let the rich kids see how the other side lives, right? That it's not all going to be easy streets, and sometimes you might have to actually get your hands dirty. And it gives the financially disadvantaged a chance to talk to the representatives who represent them by working in City Hall directly with those representatives. Uh, anyway, I mean, mandatory civil service is not a bad idea, but it requires some thought to implement it, uh, and especially if you want to do so fairly, if Ramaswamy really wants to build a country, and uh, he does want to build a country, because Vivek Ramaswamy is one of the 2024 presidential candidates for the Republican Party. I quite like this book. It was well written, it was well researched, I learned just how deep corporate rot goes, and just how detrimental woke pandering can be on big business, big finance, internationally and to our country, which is being destroyed by capitalism's embrace of this thoroughly toxic ideology. And I was impressed enough that while I don't agree with everything he says, and we all know that I lean heavily towards the anarcho-capitalism branch of libertarianism, I, I might vote for him. Like seriously, if he actually gets on the ticket for 2024, I, I'd consider it. It depends on who the libertarians throw out. So next year will be interesting, to say the very least. And uh, that's it for this week. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to hit subscribe. And I will see you guys next Sunday, where we're going to kind of cleanse our brains with a book on a president, which will be William McKinley, before jumping into next month's topic. Bye.